Thank you for taking the time to listen to our weekly service. This is a listener-supported ministry, and we ask that you pray and see what God would have you give. Now let's get to our sermon for today. How does God reveal himself to us? Now that is an extremely deep subject that would take a long time, so I'm going to briefly go over some basics this morning about it. And there's lots of verses I could use, but I'm going to use this 1 John chapter 5, verse 20. <coughs> For we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him that it is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. God has given us an understanding to know him. He has revealed, while well, in doing so, he has revealed himself to us as well. He reveals to us the way to live our lives. He reveals to us the path that we should take in our life. When God walked with Adam and Eve, I want you to think about that for a moment. He showed us that he wants to reveal himself to us and that he wants to walk with us. He walked with them in the cool of the evening, had fellowship with them. They had a great relationship going. And that's what God wants from all of us as Christians. In the Old Testament, God came to the people by way of dreams. Uh, by way of angels would visit and talk to them. And he would just speak to them. Now, I'm not sure how he did that. I just got finished reading about Elijah and Elijah. I never do sure if I pronounce those two names separately. It's so close. But when you read about that, all of a sudden, one's sitting on the hill. The next thing you know, he gets up and goes down and says, God told, said this. So the question is, how did God speak to him about that? I don't know. But what I do know is that's the way it took place in the Old Testament. But now, God reveals himself in a different way to us today. And in the New Testament, it's all about faith. Trusting in God. And if God gave us everything, we wouldn't need faith, would we? If God spoke to us directly, we wouldn't necessarily need faith. If I saw an angel and knew it was an angel... I mean, let's face it, where would faith need to be anymore? I would know. I would see it. And that's why the moment we get to heaven, there is no more faith. Because I will see God. I will see Jesus Christ. I'll see Moses and Elijah and all these people. So the first thing I want you to see is God reveals himself foremost through his word. We have the ultimate Hamburg book. You pick that book up. God's will, his will is written in the Word of God. He tells us in there that how to have a marriage. Tells specifically how to treat your wife or your husband or your children. Tells you even how to run a business. Tells you how to treat your neighbors. How to live a righteous life. It's the ultimate Hamburg book. And it's the will of God. If you have a problem in your life, you go to the Bible, find out where it speaks about it, and then you look it up and go there to be encouraged. Now, there's, there's lots of what we call topical Bibles out there. Maybe one of you have one, I don't know, but a topical Bible, everything's listed by title. It's not a Bible that you open up, Genesis, Exodus, what it is, it simply opens up and has topics. And when you look at the topic, it'll say like sin, it'll give you all the verses in that Bible for sin. That's something you could use, but here's something really neat. I handed this out to a lot of you. I got three of them left. If anybody doesn't have one, I'll hand them out. You pick this up. This is, this is how you learn God's will, and this is how you learn how God reveals things to you. When you pick this up, Just I'm going to hit a couple things here. Men's questions, God's answers. Is there a God? There's the verses to look it up. Am I accountable to God? Does he know all about me? And it's got verses for all these things. And I can keep going. I mean, it's a list there. How do I live a Christian life? 
It's another topic, and it goes through. Relying on the Holy Spirit gives you verses for that. Trusting Jesus as Lord gives you verses for that. Pray without ceasing gives you verses for that. Search the Scripture daily gives you verses. I mean, you're without excuse, people. And this is only the first two pages. <laughs> this opens up to this. I mean, it's huge. And it's made, by the way, to put glue here. I guess you get a glue that doesn't go through and destroy it. And you put it in your Bible. That's what it was actually made for. But this is the part I want you to think about. When to, uh, what to read when is the title. In sorrow. When you're in danger. God seems distanced away from you. Hey, let's face it. We have times like that. And then it tells you what scripture to go to. So you can be encouraged by who? God. In his word. That he can show you his will. You can't sleep at night. Tells you where to go to. When you're bored, when you're jealous, when you're angry. Hey, that's a good one. When you're growing old. <laughs> I got to read that a lot. <laughs> it says, think on these things. Diligence, honesty, generosity, humility, love, commitment. Got all kinds of stuff there. Talks about great Bible uh, passages, where to find the Ten Commandments, the Lord's Prayer, the Beatitudes, Sermon on I mean, this is just full of information. I haven't even read everything yet. But anyhow, this is just one of many things that you can get. And by the way, I'll give the three out. If anybody needs them, I'll order more. Well, I will afterwards. No, I, I don't want to make copies. That would be copyright law. I'd rather just buy them. But uh, uh, we got, i got to be careful. This is a ministry. And uh, but uh, these books are there to help us to be able to go in and find the will of God. I will be glad to help you find these books or, or get these. Or And I got one at home that it looks like a New Testament, but it isn't. And it's similar to this, but it just it's where to find, like when you're feeling bad. It's a huge topic. Someone gave me that as a present many years ago. But there's all kinds of books out there that you can look up and see these things. And all. Psalms 119.11. Go to that. Psalms 119.11 Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. When you take God's word and you hide it in your heart, you have a less of a chance to do sin against God. You read, the more you read the Bible, just by virtue of reading, repetition reading, you will learn. You will, you will start memorizing. You may not remember the exact reference, but the verse will stick with you from reading it over and over again. That's why I encourage you to read through the Bible every year, year after year after year. Just keep reading it. Because eventually it's going to keep coming together as a, a puzzle will come together. The more you read, the more Scripture sticks with you. It's amazing the power of God if you use it. And we got the how-to book right here as the Bible. God's will is in it. It's just amazing. In Romans chapter 10, verse 17, it says this, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So the more you hear the word, the more you read the word, the more it sticks with you. What happens when you get more of that? Your faith grows. You start trusting God more. You start seeing God work more in your life. And God reveals more to you the closer you get to him. You talk about getting a close relationship, let's face it. You've been married, or you're going to be married. <laughs> or you've had a mom and dad, or you have brothers and sisters. And what do you do? The more you communicate with each other, the closer you are. Just a, a natural fact. And you've got to do the same thing with God. Let me help you understand something else about God's Word. This is where I think people get confused about. The, th the thing... When God shows or reveals to us in His Word as we read it and study it, it's not something we need to pray about. I want to explain this, what I'm trying to say here. There are things in the Word of God that are clear as a bell. Thou shalt not do this. Thou shalt do this. Very clear. You know, the moment you read it, you're supposed to obey it. 
You don't pray about it. You don't say, I need to be convicted about it. God tells us in the Old Testament when he talked to Saul, obedience is better than sacrifice. Saul, God told Saul to go and take care of these people and kill them and, and kill the cattle, everything. Saul keeps some choice cattle and brings it back. Why did he do it? He did it for what, number one, he says a good thing. Well, in a sense, it, it sounded like a good thing. I came back to sacrifice this to the Lord. Well, that sounds like a good thing. But it's not what God told him to do. God said kill all. And from that moment on, God withdrew from him. Saul's life went downhill from that. He still was saved, but he went downhill. But he lost the blessings from God. Because he didn't do what God told him to do. And God says obedience. We, I hear people all the time, I haven't been convicted about this yet. God hasn't convicted me. God doesn't convict people when it's a thou shalt clear thing. Now, let, let me give you a quick subject. An illustration. It does not say any place in scripture, and if it does, you can bring it out to me. But it doesn't say specifically, thou shall not take alcohol or wine. Okay, But it does say, don't get drunk. Specifically says, don't get drunk. It says, stay away from it. When you pick up something that you know has a alcohol high contact, it says, stay away from it. They use it to turn when it's red and moving and all. It goes into detail about that. So, that would be something you would pray to God about to be convicted about where you go and where you don't. You know where not to go, but there's a little gray area right there. Now for me, I stay away from it. Like I try to tell, share with Tom. Tom gave me permission to talk to him about today, even if had he been here. I asked him because of what took place last week. I'm going to share some of that with you later. But uh, I told him, I said, you're going to have to get away from that stuff. It's that is destroying your marriage, your life, you lost your job, you've done everything because of it. And he understands that. But it took him quite a ways down for him to wake up to that effect. It took one of these to change his whole life. That's what changed his whole life, that coin. Understand the difference between obedience and praying to God for a conviction. There's lots and lots of stuff in the Word of God that the moment you read it, it's that point. You don't pray. I mean, now, let me clarify one other part. Say that there's something in my life I didn't realize was sin. I read the Word of God. Oh, look! It's sin. I shouldn't be doing this. Stop doing it. But guess what happens the next day? I did it again. Now I got to go to God and I got to say, Lord, help me. It may be a habitual thing where I'm a habit. I know for me, uh, when I first got saved, I wasn't a heavy, heavy uh, using foul language, but I did use a lot. I came from the north. Everybody up there used foul language. And, uh, and uh, it took me a while. It was a habit. I didn't think about it. It just popped in there, especially if you got real angry. So I had to keep praying to God about to get victory over that. But the goal was, when I heard and when I saw how my speech was supposed to be, what I do? I start, I, see, I still had to pray to get victory over it, but I was immediately trying to obey what God gave me to do, to clean up my act, to be Christ-like. And there's so many other subjects we can bring up. So I hope you understand the difference there. Obedience, doing what God specifically, clearly says to those that is kind of a little hairy that you got to pray and, and those that you got to get rid of. Okay, secondly, God reveals himself through us, ourselves. God opens and closes doors in our lives. We need to be close enough to him to know which door to go through. Now, let's face it, I don't know, I, I'm sure each of you have experienced this before. I, I, I do it all the time. I may have several doors that look good, biblically look good, but only one is God's will. The other one is not. 
And I've said this in, in talking to some ministers and other people I've had a chance to either witness to out in the field. I tell them, I said, listen, there are people out there that are pastors of churches preaching the gospel and are out of the will of God. People are getting saved and they're not in God's will. They're there because they want to be there because they want to be the pastor, not necessarily in God's will. You can do something good and not be in God's will. It can be a great thing, but yet still not be in God's will. The Apostle Paul went three separate areas to try to go to the field. The first one he went, it was a good thing, but the Holy Spirit stopped him. The second time he went, it was a good thing. He was going there to preach the word and all. He was going to do everything right, but the Holy Spirit stopped him. Not until the third time, the Holy Spirit said, this is where I want you to go. Now he was in God's will. So we, yes, is it possible to do something good and be out of God's will? Sure. Can somebody get saved? Yeah. But the key is, as Christians, we need to seek God's will. And he uses us, as well as his word, to direct us through doors. Well, how are you going to know which door to go through? Well, the more you are, uh, the more you know, the closer you get to him, the more sensitive you are going to be to his leading. James says, if you lack wisdom, pray and he'll give it to you. So do you lack? I know I lack it. I'm praying that all the time. Just like I shared with you last week or the week before. It always bothers me when I'm out there at these rallies, especially, and someone comes by and I'm trying to witness to him, trying to look for an opportunity, and then it goes, they, they leave. And then after they leave, I'm sitting there in my chair waiting for the next opportunity and realize, why didn't I say this? Why didn't I say that? Oh, this would have been perfect. And, but yet, I didn't think of it the moment they were in front of me. Or I didn't take the opportunity to witness to that person that was in front of me at that moment. i got to keep praying for wisdom for God to show me and open my goofy mind to take advantage of when he's speaking to me. When he's directing me. When he wants me to witness. And what words to say to that person when I do witness. I'm always at awe at the way God witnessed what we read in the Word of God. Especially my favorite one is just in the sand. When he's doodling in the sand and all. And they bring that uh, harlot to him and all. And he doesn't even look up. He just sits there and doodles. Just says, okay, you want, you want to kill her? You want to obey the law? You with the, has the least amount of sin or no sin in your life, throw the first stone. Nobody could do that. They all left. And then what's he tell her? Where's your, where's your accusers? She says, they all left. She says, well, I accuse you not. I'm not going to accuse you or judge you either. Go and sin no more. Listen to what he said now. He didn't just say go. He said, go and get your life right. We've got to do some things in ourselves in God's will. It's not enough for us to come in here and sit like a bump on the log. By the way, it's great that you take notes. But what good is taking notes and you go out there and don't do nothing with them? It doesn't do you any good to learn something here and walk out that door and never use it. That's why James says, it's funny, I'm talking to James a lot today. I didn't plan on it. But what James says, show me thy faith by thy works. I'll, when I see in your life, then I'll know your faith. Salvation is not a one-time event. I don't know if you ever thought about this. It's a one-time event the moment you accept Christ as your personal Savior. So you're saved. That's a one-time event. But the process is continuous until the day you die. And we call that process sanctification. The process of becoming holy. I've been teaching you that over and over again. Hopefully it's getting in and sinking in. The process is to get closer to God. That's what the process is all about. Get that close relationship with God. So the moment he speaks... Oh, I, got, I hadn't thought about this. Now my wife and I have been together... <laughs> 40s well counting going going together we went steady or uh, off and on for what four years four years before we got married so roughly close to 50 years we've been together 
This is my high school sweetheart, in case you don't know. Uh, I know what she's thinking before she says something. And she knows me before I say something. Now, that didn't happen overnight. But it happened because I love her and she loves me. And we get, we become, and matter of fact, have you ever thought about what scripture says when it says two will be joined together and become one? I think there's more to it. I think literally, and this has happened, I've become more like her and she's become more like me. That part is the bad part. <laughs> the good part is me coming like her. But uh, the, the key is that we have gotten so close. Now, that's the key to God. For us to get to know our Savior and our God so close that we know exactly what He thinks before He says something to us. He's always speaking, but He's speaking softly. And I've had to learn to listen, and I think all of us have to learn to listen. Just like I mentioned about the, the um, Easy Rider Rodeo Rally. I brought it up before. That's my big lesson for me in my life. Now, I haven't got it totally down, but I wanted that spot. He kept telling me this spot. I finally said, shut up and listen. I said, I think God's talking through this guy. And I finally decided, I'm going to go. I'm trusting God that this is what your will is. And I did, and it was the perfect spot. But if I was going to stay in myself and be stubborn, I'd have been over there, but it wouldn't have been the best spot. We have to learn to listen to God speak through His Word, through the Sunday sermons, through the Bible studies, through our reading every day, through our prayer life, when God's softly speaking to us. God is leading us every day, and sometimes we are simply just not listening. Oh, let me share you Gary Wheeler. Gary, me and Gary Wheeler, he's a longtime friend, Christian. Uh, he's a CPA, and I met with him this last week about some stuff I needed to talk to him about, the ministry and stuff. Uh, he has a CPA firm, but he goes to the mission field. He's going to Turkey this summer to witness with the local churches in Turkey, and he's also going to New York. He goes to New York every year, and they go out in the street and pray for people and try to lead them to Christ. Well, anyhow, he was telling me about something that I thought was kind of unique. When he was in college, he had a burden to help these young people. There was about 20 of them. Well, he couldn't handle them all by himself. So he was talking to some his friends. How about helping me? He couldn't get one friend to help him. He says, there was this girl in, her, in his class that he could not stand and she hated him as bad as he she, he hated her. They didn't like it. But she knew she would help him. So after no one would help, she he bit the bullet and asked her to help. And she did. And they were able to do the ministry. But you know what the, the funniest thing about the whole thing is? They married each other. They fell in love and got married. And they've been happily married. And when he told me this last week, now his kids are out in college, past college, some are married, and they have grandkids and all that. So this happened a long time ago. He was in tears telling me that. And the reason he was is how God worked. What if he never asked her because he didn't like her? God works in unusual ways. Think about this. We may not be mature enough to hear Him and must study the Word so we can mature. Doesn't the Word of God tell us to take the sincere milk of the Word that we may grow thereby and eventually get to the meat and keep growing? We should be growing every week. I try to say this and I, I can't repeat it enough. You can't be in a plateau with God. You're either growing or you're going backwards. But it's no in-between. If I don't see growth in your life, you're going backwards. That's why I use the term, be careful that you're not a bump on the log when you come in here every week. You come, but you don't grow. We need growth. All of us do. I can't stop growing. You can't stop growing. All of us got to continue growing. 
the more we know, the more mature we got, the more what? We hear every word God is telling us what direction to go, what to do. Remember Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38. Hebrews 10, 38 says, Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. When you draw back, when you're not doing what you're supposed to do, God has no pleasure in you. God tells us that we as Christians need to live by faith and to continue. Let's face it, if God gave us everything, why would we need faith? If you think about it, if God gave us everything, you know what we'd be? A spoiled brat. Look at the people out there that get everything from people that have all the money to give. And what happens? Most of those kids are spoiled brats. One of the biggest problems we have right now when I look in the actresses and all these young actors and, and boys and girls that have millions and millions and millions of dollars and own Lamborghinis and all. What are they doing? Racing down Miami. They don't care. They got enough money to get them back out of jail and pay a lawyer. Same thing with some, some, uh, some of the girl actresses that are in jail and out so often taking drugs, taking this, because they're getting bored with life because they got all this money. And they're so immature at such a young age. Most of the time God speaks softly to us and we have to get to the point where we can learn to listen to God and know which direction He wants us to go. God reveals Himself to us at least most of the time in our life. Every moment. God's directing us what to say, where we go. You go to the abate meeting. Maybe you want to say something there and then you choose not to or you choose to. And then how are you going to say it? Or maybe back at the family between husband and wife or between your kids or to some friends out there or at a uh, poker run or whatever. Abraham waited 60 years for his son. 60 years. I don't know if you can comprehend that. A promise. He waited 60 years for the promise. And what did God do? Number one, he waited till they were out of childbearing age. When that child was going to come, it was going to be no doubt that it was of God. And God was going to get the glory. That was the whole purpose of it. That's why they waited so long. And the other purpose was, does Abraham have the faith to trust me that long? My question is, do you have the faith to trust God for whatever length of time he waits when you present him with prayers and directions in your life. Take a moment and look back at time and see that most of the time God always waits to the last moment to bless you. He does in my life. Very rarely do I get blessed right away. I've actually had some things done to me that I never prayed about. But it's so rare. It's one tenth of one percent. <laughs> it's usually wait to the last moment. Why? Because it will always take faith to trust in Him. And that's what He's looking for. How much faith you have. He wants us to know that He is doing the work in us. And that we're not doing it. God wants the glory for whatever gets done. Oh, look what I did! Instead of, praise God and look what He did for me in my life. To put it in a nutshell, God comes... To provide when we think all is lost. What's the old term? Wake up and smell the roses. Get a life. Because that's the way it's going to be. And it ain't going to change. We go out on our own and we end up in failure. Or we manage to make it on our own. And it's always the hard way. That's what I've seen looking back in time on the things that I do accomplish. Now, God's name tells it all. Moses asked God, what is your name, before he went to the children of Israel. He says, they're going to ask me, what's your name? His name is, and this is the personal name of God. You may already know it. I am that I am. That is the personal name. Okay? Now, that gets translated to Yah, uh, see Adonai, uh, Yahweh, then to Jehovah. That's all the same name. Okay, it's just some with vowels, some not, and all that. But 
it all comes back to I am that I am. And this is what it means. I am whatever your need is at the time you need it. That's his answer. And that's what Moses has to tell the children of Israel. I will be there for you to take you out. I'll be there for you to get you out. Now, you know there was a reason for the plagues and all that stuff? God could have got them out right away. God did that for two reasons. Number one, to show Egypt that he was God. Second reason was to show Israel that he was God. He wasn't just going to bring them out. He had to show he's the one in control. You will see God's name throughout the Old Testament. Abraham, at the time with, when he was going to sacrifice his son, used the term Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord will provide. You'll see that through the Old Testament. You'll see the word Jehovah, and then there'll be something attached to it. And that's always the human saying, God did this for me. God did that for me. It's all about God. God provided for that person. And we must learn to listen as God speaks. Now for the last thing, the third thing, is sin keeps God from revealing himself to us. You've got to understand that. If you're going to let sin in your life, God's not going to reveal. The highest we talked about the Holy Spirit is going to lose control. He's not going to work in our life. Pastor Grammer uh, is the guy that led my wife and I to the Lord. And he wrote in my Bible, after I got saved, he wrote this in the Bible. He said, sin will keep you from this book, comma, but this book will keep you from sin. I don't know if that's original, where he got it from, but I tell you what, it makes a lot of sense. The more I know the Word of God, the less I'll sin. The more I sin, the less I'm going to pick up that Bible and pick it up and read it and do my devotions or pray. The more I sin, I haven't, the less the Holy Spirit is going to work. Now, let me mention Thomas. I asked Thomas if I could say this, and he told me, he says, I'm sorry I'm not going to be there. He says, because I know I told you I'd let you talk about it. But I said, I'm going to talk about you whether you're here or not. <laughs> but anyhow, now some of you may know part of this or all of it. I don't know, but I don't think everybody knows everything. Okay, Shooter came and visited us two weeks ago. He does not know Thomas, and he doesn't know Thomas comes here. Thomas has never met Shooter, and Thomas didn't know Shooter had been here two weeks ago. So the Saturday before Easter, Thomas is at a bar, contemplating, he's, he says, my life is at the bottom, and I'm thinking about committing suicide. And he was at the verge. I don't know about committing at that moment, but at least that night. Shooter walks in with these coins that we gave him, doesn't know Thomas from anything, is handing out the coins in the bar, gives one to Thomas, and he goes over and starts shooting pool. Shooter does. Thomas walks over sometimes later and he says, I want you to know you saved my life tonight when you gave me that coin. Now, this coin just says, thousands died for my freedom. One died for my soul. Then it says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. You know, Thomas knows that. But God spoke to him through this coin. So anyhow, Shooter gets a real burden for Thomas after they left. And he prays all night until the next day. I don't mean, I, I'm sure he went to sleep and all, but he prayed. Now, Shooter came in late that day. He got up late and all came in. He did not know Thomas was going to be here. Now, Thomas calls me last Sunday morning. Now, I didn't call him. He called me. And he says to me, Glenn, he says, listen, you know, because we had an ongoing thing where Steve would pick him up and bring him to church since he hadn't had a job. He called Steve. Steve's knees were hurting, he said, and he couldn't go to make it. So then Thomas calls me up, and so we got to talking. And before he could say, I'm not going to make it, I told him, I said, Thomas, there's got to be a point in your life where you're going to have to jump out in faith and really trust God for something. He says, what do you mean? I said, you told me you got $11 in the bank and no gas. I said, to me, I think you need to spend that $11 in gas and be here this morning. And he said, well, I, I, you know, and then he got to talking, talking, and I, the more we got to talking, he didn't have excuses, we just got talking. 
Then all of a sudden, God got a hold of me. He said, give him the money. So I said, Thomas, listen, you come here. I'll give you the money for gas. He says, okay, I'll be right there. He hung up immediately, and he came. Now, he's here. We all, you know, welcomed him, told him how much we've been praying for him, and we rejoiced him being here. Shooter walks in at the end. Walks over, says hi to people, and the next thing you know, him and Thomas are hugging each other, and I don't know if you caught this, they were both crying. I'm going, what's going on? I don't know what's going on. I must have that to myself. And the next thing you know, Shooter grabs me with Thomas and walks me back over there and starts talking to me about what happened. And I'm going, gosh, this is awesome. Now I want you to talk about, we're talking about God revealing yourself. Look how, I said, Thomas, this was no accident. This didn't just happen. Shooter told me uh, two, several days later, we were talking on the phone. And he says, I really believe God's got a hold of Thomas's heart. And he's responding. But because he's so caught up in alcoholism, it's going to take a while to get off of it. And when he came over to my house, I'm a hardcore, or whatever you want to say, you know, don't do it, don't drink, don't do this. I got, God got a hold of my heart, and I told Tom, I said, Tom, I said, I realize now that you're going to probably have to drink a beer here and there. I'm not agreeing that you should do it, but I understand it. And I'm telling you, I'm going to be here for you, and I'm not going to hound you. Because I already knew that you were in a bar on Monday. And I said, I already know you took two drinks in that bar. I'm not going to tell you how I know that, but I said, it's amazing how God brings things to me. But I want you to know, I'm going to be here for you. And I know it's going to take a little bit to get off. So I understand. And so we did that. He ended up getting a job. He helped me at, in, in the yard. I gave him some money for helping me. And, uh, and we had a good week together. And, all, and I still think God's working in his heart, so we need to really, really pray. But the reason I brought this up is, see how God works behind our backs? Sometimes we'll never know how God's working behind our backs. We may never know, but this particular time, God showed us. When God reveals himself to us, we will forever be changed. He reveals himself by the way of the word of God. And we have to learn it. We've got to search the scripture daily to see what's right and what's wrong. We must take the time to learn as much as possible. God will reveal himself through us. He will give us directions to go. And this coming Sunday we're all going in different directions. But let me tell you something. Whether we're in Columbia or in Ohio or in Cherokee, God can use us to be a witness to him. I'm a member of Abate, and I like what Abate's doing, but I don't go to Abate first because of Abate. I go there because I want to be a testimony to all those people there. I want them to come to know Christ, and then I support Abate secondly. When you go to Columbia, it's the first reason you're there is to share the gospel with people, to be a testimony to them. Then, for all the other reasons, you're there. Will He will use us if we're listening and will lead us if we listen and pay attention and respond. Be doers of the word, not just hearers. As surely as you are here this morning, God is in work in your life or you wouldn't be here. The question is, are you going to respond to what God is trying to lead you to do? Think about that. He wants to use us more and more. Will you let God use you in whatever direction he takes you? And it may not be in the direction you think, because I want to tell you something. Being in motorcycle ministry was not in, on my list of things to do. Period. It wasn't even a consideration. I sold the bikes before I came down to go to school. I had three of them. Sold them. I didn't even bring them down. I had my brother sell them, send me the money. Thought I'd never be back on a motorcycle, ever. Never had my Harley back then either. I grew up like my wife. Uh, one day I got to find that thing. She put it in uh, something, a page in the old look. I think it was a look magazine. And it was an advertisement for a Harley. 
And it says, when did it first happen to you? I'll never forget it. And it has a baby in diapers. And my wife said, that's when it happened to you. I want you to write down this question, if you would. I'll repeat it several times here. Take the time to write this down. How is God revealing himself in your life today? How is God revealing himself in your life today? And at some time before you go to bed tonight, read that list. How is God revealing himself in your life today? Let's pray. We pray that we have been a blessing to you. For further assistance, call us at 864-270-1472 anytime. Send email to info at stlmm.org or visit our website at www.stlmm.org. Like any ministry, it costs money to operate. Please consider supporting this ministry as God leads you with your prayers and your financial gifts by going to www.stlmm.org and clicking on Donations.